Hello and welcome to Season 3, Episode 5 of Unlimited Opinions. I'm Adam Bishop. I'm Mark Bishop. And we are, of course, reading Austin Freeman's Tolkien Dogmatics, Theology Through Mythology with the Maker of Middle-Earth. This time we are talking about a very interesting subject, Revelation, and how Tolkien perceives Revelation through his works, whether or not he was in some form divinely inspired to write about Middle-Earth and Lord of the Rings and the Silmarillion and everything like that. So fascinating discussion. Uh, I really like this chapter. What do you think of this chapter overall? What a surprise. You like this chapter. I, I did not anticipate that statement from you. Just joking. Sarcasm. Um, uh, again, well written. Uh, I'm going to have some questions for you. Mm-hmm. Uh, references. Now, he, he does have it footnoted. So uh, when he references Tolkien's writings, which I assume the footnotes will then explain what he's referring to, but I refuse uh, to read footnotes in a uh, mass producer for a mass audience type thing. If it's a research or a case, you know, I will read footnotes, but I, I feel like that's too much work. I don't, I don't think the content should be in footnotes. Mm. Uh, and I am offended by that. Now, if it's a citing a certain, uh, you know, book or publication, yeah, I don't need that in the text. But, you know, if you can't, if I don't even know what the hell you're talking about, other than reading, you know, what I, it requires me to read the, the footnote, then I, obviously this is a, this is almost like a a book for like a college class or something, mm-hmm. in my opinion, you yeah. know, because it's so in-depth and, and uh, for the uh, Tolkien nerds, but entertaining, interesting. Yes. And of course it covers a lot of religious and philosophical concepts and then he and, and this one it seems to have uh, a better handle on uh tolkien's uh, beliefs or philosophy or whatever mm-hmm. as it relates yeah. to revelation well if austin freeman is listening i hope he takes the uh the footnotes comment in, into account for the second edition and he makes those changes which as we yeah. mentioned last week there is a slight possibility that uh, dr austin freeman has at least listened partially to one of these episodes well, your mother has listened to four episodes or maybe more of season three, mm. which was the uh, Bill Moyers one. Mm-hmm. Joseph and, Campbell. Uh, yes, Joseph Campbell interview by Bill Moyers. And um, she's, she's, she has um, figured out a conspiracy that uh, of one that evidently my voice is toned down relative to yours so and since you're in charge of mixing us mm-hmm. i think that you are trying to suppress my voice i have not tried to suppress your voice that's a weird thing that zoom does i think you sound very loud to me right now and then when i go into the recording later you sound quieter uh, and i try to equalize it as best as possible uh, and i'm not sure why that is i'm sure i'm doing something wrong but if any tech geniuses are, are listening to the, to the podcast right now i want to give us some tips on how to mix things better you can, of course, DM us on Twitter or tweet at us at ULMTD Opinions. That's where you can find us there. Um, so just, just throwing that out there. I, I did appreciate that that was the first time that your mother said she wanted to hear me, but she did not. <laughs> <laughs> so I got to experience that for the first time in our, our somewhat lengthy marriage. Uh, anyway, so let me, uh, let, let's, let's talk about Revelation. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, you know, the book does a good job of briefly explaining what we're even talking about, Revelation. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it's basically uh, something that, um, you know, theologically defined as some form of, form of communication from the divine that gives a truth otherwise unknown to the recipient. And it could be either general or specific. General, general, general revelations include truths that can be approached through science and philosophy without the Bible special revelations and anything that you couldn't figure out on your own and you need a God to say, hey, this is what's up, dummy. Um, and, you know, it, it, you know, I guess he, he has a summary of of what we're going to talk about. I'll just kind of skip that because, well, he gets kind of right into general revelation. Mm-hmm. And I immediately have questions. <laughs> sure. Uh, because he, he starts talking about um, Tolkien providing an example of natural theology in Middle Earth in Ferial song. Is that something we've already talked about? That's not the Valar or whatever, right? No, I, I don't believe so. I'm actually going to look this up right now. I'm not entirely sure off the top of my Oh my, of my gosh, head. how do you not know? And I, I think I've read it, I just don't recognize the name because um, it's included with the History of Middle-Earth series uh, in the Lost Road and other writings. So I have read it before. Um, mm-hmm. I've just forgotten uh, what exactly the, it is. The second question is, when you read it, do you have to sing it? Uh, but 
And then he also mentions um, Miriam Pippin reflecting on their knowledge and uh, and then Aragorn's regal display in the House of Healing. I don't know what that references to. What is the Aragorn's display in the House of Healing? What is that this is this is a very small part of the Return of the King, um, which really is featured very, very briefly in the extended editions of the movies. You see Aragorn kind of doing some sort of medicine type thing over Eowyn, you know, after her encounter with the Witch King and she's got her arm broken and stuff and they take her back into, into Minas Tirith right. and, he, and he heals her up. Um, and so this is really just a, a sort of a side conversation between Merry and Pippin as they're witnessing this. They're like, oh, this guy's really cool. You know, he can he can heal people like this. You know, where's our part in this world? How can we compare to such, you know, great things and things like that? And that's where he's that's what he's talking about here. Aha. Uh-huh. So that uh, makes a lot more sense to me. And I'm sure, you know, it's just been such a long time since I read the books. And so my real frame of reference is, is the movies, quite mm-hmm. frankly, you know, and, and um, you know, reading different things about it. But uh, um, but anyway, so I guess you haven't figured out what Ferial's song is. It is, it is a very brief poem that Tolkien wrote oh. originally in uh, Quenya, one of his Elvish languages, um, I can read just part of it here. The father made the world for elves and mortals, and he gave it into the hands of the lords. They are in the west. They are holy, blessed, and beloved, save the dark one. He has fallen. Alcor or Melkor has gone from earth. It is good. For elves they made the moon, but for men the red sun, which are beautiful. To all they gave in, gave in measure the gifts of Iluvatar. The world is fair, the sky, the seas, the earth, and all that is in them. Lovely is Numenor. But my heart resteth not here forever, for here is ending, and there will be an end in the fading. When all is counted and all numbered at last, but yet it will not be enough, not enough. What will the father, O father, give me in that day beyond the end when my son faileth? So generally just talking about nature and what has been given to, to, to the mortals and, you know, seeing the gods through that. I'm now sorry I asked. I am very sorry to, to have provided you <laughs> the information that you requested. <laughs> uh, anywho, so, um, so we're talking about Revelation. I guess that uh, poem or writing or whatever kind of taps into what uh, the author's talking about and and um and he goes into some detail about this discussion between mary and pippin i guess this is what you were referencing when aragorn's doing his healing magic and putting the uh, moss on somebody's wound or something right sure yes right, right and uh and one of the things that i thought was kind of interesting in this discussion is a reference god does not leave himself without a witness even of a brief one which i thought was kind of hmm. interesting and then they recognize that there is more to the to the truth and they can currently access, but they appreciate what light they have. Kind of like a, you know, acknowledgement that we have limited knowledge, but also, uh, you know, that there is, there is something that you can know, which is that there is a God or is there a higher power and, and all that stuff. And so then uh, the author talks about, again, I think we talked about this last episode about, you know, all people possessing an innate knowledge of the true God in varying degrees. And um, and this is, I think, a pretty universal Christian thought. Don't you think? Mm-hmm. Is you know, like they even even non-believers have some sort of innate knowledge that, of the mm-hmm. existence of God and, and some sense of what should be morality. Mm-hmm. Um, you you find some differences of opinion. I think not necessarily in the idea that you can find some sort of good, but in like whether those people are like saved or not. Right. Because mm-hmm. you find a lot of discussion. I think I'll talk about this a little bit later with like virtuous pagans. But of course, you know, Jesus says no one can get to the father except through me. And so a lot of people are like, well, you know, if you don't recognize Jesus, you know, you're just going to hell. And that that's that's the end of it. But I think I'm not entirely sure what exactly the Catholic Church's position on it is. But I knew they they do have some sort of idea that, you know, if you've just never heard of Jesus, if you if you've, you're living in a society that just does not have that and you still live a good life, like according to your conscience and what you can get from, you know, general revelation, then you can still get to heaven, um, at least as far as I, I, I'm aware. You know, I envision um, Jesus saying that uh, in this, like I, my vision of that is him standing in a chasm uh, very similar to uh, the 300 in the Battle of Thermopylae, but mm-hmm. it's just him. Uh, and he's screaming at the advancing tide of non-believers. Uh, you know, no one gets to the to heaven or the Lord Father, but through me. I was like, thinking you were going to make a more topical reference and talk about Gandalf against the Balrog in, in, the, in the chasm. I was but... not going to make that reference. I was just envisioning a very violent uh and destructive jesus on the throngs of people that just don't have the the saving knowledge of mm-hmm. jesus 
and uh and then just destroying them very very christian of you <laughs> well you know what well, we've had this discussion before you know i don't i don't i don't see jesus as this super friendly cat i mean mm-hmm. i think he was, i think he was very understanding and and forgiving and all that kind of stuff but i don't see him as non-judgmental mm-hmm. and i i i envision um uh, somewhat wrathful God when it comes to, mm-hmm. to some things, you know, I mean, I, I don't, I don't, I, 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 as I get older, I, I more understand the thought of the fear of God. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, like, uh, you don't hear it much in Catholic, uh, descriptions of faith or, you know, like God fearing man, but you hear it in other denominations more. And it always struck me as odd as a, as, as a young person or a child. Why would I be afraid of God? Mm-hmm. You know, he is, he is good. Well, I'm afraid of him because of things I've done mm-hmm. <laughs> and the expected judgment anyway. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. I think it's I think it's also, you know, something that I've heard a lot is people reference like the, you know, before you remove the splinter from somebody else's eye, you know, remove the log from your own. And I think mm-hmm. a lot of people take that to be like, OK, don't judge anybody ever. Like we've all done bad things. Yeah, I don't I don't know if that's entirely the point. You know, if Jesus wanted to say, don't judge people, he would have just said, don't judge people. I think it's more of make sure you are clearly judging others. Because it's like, if you have a log in your eye, you're not going to see their faults clearly. So make sure you remove the log in your own eye before you judge them according to to, to the law and to what is just. Yeah, well, I, I, I tend to think, yeah, and I tend to agree with that. I also think that it's, um, you have to make judgments about, actions and and ideas and concepts and sins and mm-hmm. what is good and what is bad whether you can i don't know that we can actually judge the true morality of people like mm-hmm. even even murderers I, I i can't say you know that the that the that i know that the people that i prosecuted back in the day uh, for murder or other bad bad things are necessarily going to go to hell you know, I, I don't know that. So that I think I think we're he's talking about those kind of judgments. Mm-hmm. Now it doesn't mean that you can't lock those people up and, and make a judgment about the act being evil. You know, uh, and I think that's what people really get confused mm-hmm. by intentionally because they don't want to be judged. You yeah. know, when they do bad things. Um, but anyway, so you know, there is a good discussion about uh, about that, and I think in this section about that um you know true revelation uh, only occurs through the person and the work of Jesus Christ so so he went, he's talking about Jesus uh, you know right away and, and but also talking about um that God can't be limited and he can choose by any means which to dispense his grace and and I, and I think it's implied or maybe it's even said in here that you know the, the knowledge of of God and what God wants to let us know. He can do it. He's unlimited in that, in that mm-hmm. respect. And, and then it, it, I like this, I highlighted this, all truth is God's truth as Augustine, as St. Augustine reminds us. And I, I think that Tolkien, you know, the, certainly the author thinks that Tolkien would agree with that. Uh, and then I also like this, this one part of it. I don't know where this came from. He has a, he has a footnote. So I guess you can look up footnote six where he says the uh, the light of the moon depends on the, you know, like there's different types of knowledge, like moonlight and sunlight, you know, sunlight's direct knowledge and moonlight is kind of like we, uh, it's reflected knowledge or divine knowledge from, you know, the direct knowledge. Uh, and, but any and all reflection, but then the light of the moon depends on the existence of the sun. So there's gotta be some source for the truth and, and all that, even if, even if it's some sort of reflected or refracted light. Mm-hmm. Anyway. That's an so, interesting point. To, yeah. When we get into to virtuous pagans here to kind of draw it into the into this section, I think that's exactly what we were talking about a lot in, in season three, which we were talking about earlier, mm-hmm. um, sort of the idea, because Joseph Campbell takes it in more of a, of a psychological approach, you know, looking at the similarities between myth. OK, there's something psychologically within humans that makes them want to make the same stories. And I think that can be true. But I think it's also true that, you know, like we're talking about general revelation, you know, we have an innate desire to to know God, and we want to want to find God, and we can find God through the world. And so, I think a lot of the the stories throughout the world, and a lot of the mythologies and the religions uh, out there, you know, at one point in time, were attempting to find God. You know, the true God as as we know Him, um, but you know, have have misinterpreted it, and you know, have have gone in different directions. And I think that's also why we ha- we see a lot of similarities between myths, is because, like you said, there is some sort of higher truth. You know, it's like you're looking at the moon where really the light is coming from the sun. Yes. Uh, so moving into the virtuous pagans theory, mm-hmm. and I think the author does a good job in this section of 
trying to tie in Tolkien's uh, thoughts on it, uh, in grounding it in his in his writings. I, I kind of enjoyed uh, this section of it because it seemed to be a little bit more directly supported than some of the. You know, sometimes you're kind of guessing. You know, mm-hmm. you're ter- interpreting his 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 writings, but uh, of course, heavily uh, mentioning uh, Beowulf mm-hmm. and uh, I guess uh, Tolkien's translation. I guess mm-hmm. is that what it was of that, and it's it's a pre Christian text and. Um, and he and and according to the author, Tolkien really h- held this close to his heart, and he and he uh, believed in Christian inclus- inclusivism, um, meaning more or less that you know Christianity is the absolute truth, but other religions are not entirely false, <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> which is kind of like that moonlight analogy. You know, it's mm-hmm. still light. It's still it's still a benefit. It's still good. Uh, it's just not the true the full truth of Christianity, which I think is a, um, you know, certainly a, a kinder view of, of other religions than some, maybe some other religions have of their non-believers. Uh, so what do you, what do you, and then he, he does talk about um, um, the Tolkien's pagan narrator, Ariel, mm-hmm. betrays total ignorance, the ignorance of the Eru, the Supreme God, and the truth about the creation of the world. What is that about? I don't. Is, who is Ariel? So, so I mentioned this idea. I think in the last episode, but in a lot of the early drafts of the Silmarillion, he was very much trying to tie in his mythology to like the modern day. And so, mm. a lot of the early drafts of the stories that became the Silmarillion, it is told through the figure uh, of this Germanic guy. He he is on the island of England. He's looking west, and his name is Ariel. That is Ariel, and he's he's you know a pagan uh, Germanic guy, and he comes across a very old elf. Um, who he mentions here is is Lindo. And so essentially oh, all of the stories okay. of the Silmarillion are recounted through this narrator, Lindo, to Ariel, the the pagan man, um, to learn about this prehistoric age. Okay, because then he's, he's the, the author saying, the Tolkien's kind of uh, in his own way affirming that non-Christian theology can be badly mistaken if if it doesn't hold truth to some of the basic truths mm-hmm. because, you know, it's it's pagan. It's not the true Christian thing. All right, so then, so so, what are your what are your thoughts about um, you know the the virtuous pagans and the, and the other things that the the, the author talks about uh, in this section? You got any thoughts you want to share about that? Well, I really like um, Beowulf, uh, especially Tolkien's translation. So it's a really good good read, um, and I and I think like the the point is uh, of, of Beowulf. Beowulf, the story itself, like the characters within it, are not Christian. It's it's definitely an older pagan uh, story. But the person who wrote down the story was definitely a Christian. And so you get allusions to God, uh, literally the Christian God, not any Germanic gods um, within the text of Beowulf, not from the character's perspective, but from the author's perspective. And so the author's saying, like, you know, when, when Beowulf did this and this was a great deed and God, you know, saw it, you know, worthy, you know, something like that. I don't know if that's a direct quote in any way, shape or form. Um, but generally, you know, acknowledging that Beowulf's actions are still good and can be seen as good by God without them necessarily being Christian actions like this is a pagan world and they have no idea who Jesus is, um, but they can still do good actions. I think that's a lot of a lot of exactly what uh, the author is talking about here with this this virtuous pagans. So you got to remind me, it has been, I think, since high school, since I read Beowulf, Mm -hmm. whatever translation I read back in the 1980s. So Mm -hmm. there's a reference to Beowulf's King Hrothgar Mm -hmm. as being the archetypal, archetypical, typical, archetypal, archetypal. Archetypal, the, the archetypal model or virtuous pagan. Mm-hmm. Who is King Hrothgar, and do you agree with that assessment? So, so King Hrothgar was the king of the Danes, um, and so he was having this big issue um, in his hall. Um, so it's you know ancient medieval castle basically, and there's this this horrible monster called Grendel that would come into the hall and like eat people every night basically. And so he sends out like a call for, hey, come help me. Um, I need somebody to kill this this monster Grendel. Um, and that's where Beowulf comes in. And I forget a lot of the specifics of Hrothgar's character, but he is definitely like this noble king. You know, he wants to protect his people. He wants to make sure they're safe. Um, that's sort of, I think, where this idea is coming from. Uh, I'm going to give you another 80s, well, maybe it's a 90s reference. When you mentioned the King of the Danes, all I could think of was a, a big hall filled with um, uh, uh, various clones of Dane Cook, the moderately or somewhat funny comedian from the, I think, the 1990s, hmm. which kind of amused me at the time. But anyway, Wrong type of Danes. King, King of the Danes. <laughs> uh, they tell kind of funny jokes, uh, but make a lot of money doing it. 
somehow. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, for some reason, people don't like Dane Cook. I don't know if he's still alive. Anyway, <laughs> um, so and then there, there was another concept of of you know where he's talking about uh, Tolkien's belief in whether or not pagans can be saved or can go mm -hmm. to heaven, and that. And um, he mentions that Tolkien argues that uh, Christ's redemption might work backward in time and pro provide at least an opportunity for salvation for pre-Christian souls, which I think you would support, right? Because God is all time outside mm -hmm. of time. But do you think yes. he'd go back in time? Now, how do those people, and what, what happened to those people that died, that were great people, but they died before Jesus was born, lived? I think it is possible for those people to go to heaven. I'm not sure if that's 100% in line with the, with the Catholic faith, um, but but I do think it is possible. If you just have no knowledge of Jesus, you know, I don't think God would just let you, you know, exist only for the sole purpose of going to hell. You know, I, th I think God is more merciful and more understanding than that. If you if you genuinely have no idea who Jesus is and have no way of looking into who Jesus is, then I mean, I don't think you're going to hell as long as you live a good life. Because because we do have you know a conscience that you know drives us in the right direction and, and you know we do have you know pangs of guilt and stuff so as long as we follow you know what we can know about god without you know directly encountering you know jesus or, or the bible or anything as long as we follow those things i think it is possible to go to heaven it seems like you agree with what tolkien has in his writings yes i would say so um so where were those pe those souls kept what do you mean well they died like a thousand years or ten thousand years before jesus where they well, they're, they're outside of time Mm -hmm. Once, once so you die, I, you're not in the physical world anymore. I don't think so. Then you die, and uh, I guess you get a choice. Uh, hey, I'm Jesus. You want to follow me? Uh, better say yes. <laughs> <laughs> Is that how it works? I don't know. I don't think you get a choice at that point because, I mean, you have to do it during you're your done. life. You're yeah, done. I think you're done. And so but it's just either you've lived not, a... But it's not through Jesus. I guess is Jesus holding the scales, uh, you know, like the way in you, the positive and negative. That, that way it's through Jesus that you get through there. I don't know. No, or, or, is that just, or is that just an admonition for those people that came after Jesus? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I was talking about this with some of my friends uh, the other day about the, the exact role of, of Jesus, you know, in salvation and things like that. Um, and these two friends were Protestants. And so they were very much uh, of the opinion. We were talking about purgatory, especially, um, because, of course, the Protestants really don't like purgatory. Um, and so their sort of belief is, as long as you acknowledge Jesus as your Savior and you live a life according to him, then, you know, essentially, as soon as you die, all your sins are forgiven, you know, as long as you live according to his precepts. Um, and I, I, I somewhat agree with that idea. But, you know, I believe that, you know, if you die in the sins, and there are still sins on your soul that you have not asked for forgiveness for, you cannot physically encounter God with those sins on your soul. So there has to be some sort of purification process. So that would be purgatory. And that's the Catholic Church's reasoning for why we have purgatory. It's not an eternal destination. You just need some sort of purifying process in order to get to heaven and fully experience God. And that's kind of where I believe a lot of the, the you know, especially a lot of the pagans have to go. You know, I think, you know, you have to go through a purifying process, you know, if you have no knowledge of Jesus, regardless of whether you've lived a good life. If you lived a good life, then you're probably going to purgatory and then eventually to heaven. Um, but, you know, it's it's not straight to heaven, I don't think. Hmm. So it, uh, the lesson is uh, go to confession when, when you're alive so mm -hmm. that you so all you have to do is a couple of Hail Marys and an Our Father, and then bam, you're in heaven uh, when you die. Otherwise, you're in purgatory. But of course, who knows how long that would be mm -hmm. because there's no, it's outside of time. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yes. I don't know what I think about all that stuff. Mm -hmm. I haven't really, I haven't really contemplated that 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 deeply. But anyway, so to, but this is about Tolkien's philosophy, mm -hmm. theology. So uh, I think you've given a good explanation of Tolkien's point of view, which is pretty much what you've been espousing. I think. I think so. Right? I think so. Yeah. So then there's special revelation. And so what what uh, what do the author is asking, okay, what is what is Tolkien's views, because it's Tolkien dogmatics, of 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 special revelations, which are um ex, you know uh, extraordinary revelations of certain information, maybe uh, you know, uh, inspiring you to write scripture or you know, things that are coming up in the future, or premonitions or prophecies, that kind of stuff, right? Mm -hmm. am, I, am I getting it right? I would say so. Thank you. <laughs> and so he, 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 first we talk about scriptures. So what does Tolkien think about scriptures? And he, the author immediately says, well, this is a surmise, which is a really kind of a, a nice way of saying, well, I'm going to guess at this one. 
Uh, and so then he talks about Cardinal Newman's views and you kind of, when, 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 when the author is, uh, has a lack of information to really give Tolkien's views on one of these subjects, it seems like he just goes to Cardinal Newman and he says, Hey, yeah, probably agree with that. Uh, which is fair enough. Mm-hmm. At least he says it clearly that, I don't know. Uh, but he, but he does go into, um, the views, Tolkien's views, um, about whether the gospels are true and, 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 and kind of an interesting argument discussion about, you know, he has some writings about, um, you know, his, his beliefs and the, and the beliefs of the, the gospels and that essentially it's either true or Jesus was some sort of insane megalomaniac, mm-hmm. I guess. Um, there really isn't, I don't know, is there a third option other than some sort of crazy person? I mean, mm-hmm. I, don't, I don't think the option exists that Jesus didn't live. I, mm-hmm. I think it's historical fact, their contemporary records and all that. Yeah. Wasn't that pulling on um, Lewis's idea? Because wasn't he the one who said Jesus is either liar, lunatic, or Lord? Or am yeah. I thinking of somebody else? Yeah, I, th- I, think, I think that's a lot of what Freeman is pulling on here, too, is, you know, if Jesus was real and he had all of these followers, there has to be an explanation for how he got all these followers. Either he was a really good liar and told really good stories, or he was crazy and people just liked him, or he was actually, you know, the Lord. And of course, he he goes through and he he um, denies the the first two and says, you know, ultimately it has to be the Lord. And I think it's a it's a book of his. I forget which book that's in, but he goes into detail on that. Right. And so then, in, in this this particular first section, talks about you know, okay, well, establishing. That and certainly Tolkien believed that Jesus was the Lord. Um, the, the the question is scriptures. I mean, are, are these these the actual word of God, and and can the writings of somebody else be similar to a scripture? It can be the inspired. It can be divinely inspired. And I thought this was a really interesting discussion throughout this chapter. Um, and, and he mentions, you know, that the narrative of, of scripture contains the central narrative of all narratives. You know, it's like the story above all stories. Um, uh, you know, that, that, you know, the life of Christ, um, in human history, you know, parallels a lot of those, you know, those general myths that we, we've visited before in other, um, in other podcasts and that kind of stuff. And that, and, and, and Tolkien has said that, uh, the human writer can participate in this grand narrative through his or her own creative work. So you can be divinely inspired without being an actual, scripture writer as if there's some angel dictating the words to you um so what what are your thoughts about about that topic and that subject Mm -hmm. i definitely agree and i think that's really the topic that we're talking about for the the rest of this chapter um you know it's it's whether or not you know tolkien can claim any credit from from god i guess and i think it's 100 percent possible um because i think you know there, there are there are many writings throughout all of human history that are, that are definitely inspired by God, you know, whether very directly or, or indirectly. I think, you know, a lot of, you know, a lot of the, the, the great books and a lot of the great works that point to a higher truth had to have been influenced by God in some way. Because like we were talking about, the only way to the, the actual truth is through Jesus and is through God. You know, that, that's the highest truth that there is. And so if you're getting a, a glimpse of that, then God has to have some part in that. And, and I think I go back and forth on this with like, especially the more pagan authors, but, you know, definitely the, throughout the last 2000 years, a lot of the great Christian authors, you know, certainly. Um, and then I think about people, you know, like, like Plato who have had such, you know, a, a huge impact on Christian philosophy and like actual understanding of how the world works. And it's like, well, maybe parts of his, of his writings, you know, were, you know, influenced by God in some fashion in order to get them into the, into the wider world. And he did have some sort of minor revelation there. You know, I'm not entirely sure what my thoughts are on that exactly, um, but I do think it's possible for for somebody who is not a scripture writer to be divinely inspired in some fashion. And there was an interesting, it seemed to almost like uh, an aside to me, which I, I, but I'm glad you put it in here, is talking about like truth, you know, the the the, the works of God and, and working in the, in the and writing, and then also in the church, almost like the administration of the church, whether that's divinely inspired. And, and, and I just thought I'm going to I'm going to read this little section on mm-hmm. page 48 which I, I really liked. It, it is, it's, it's the failures of the church uh, ought to grieve us, but we should be careful to see ourselves properly. We ought to identify ourselves not with Jesus, but with the scandalizers like Judas and Peter. And boy, that really kind of hit home. I, mm-hmm. I think that's I think that's what a lot of us are missing, and, and me at times, but I think in our present uh, culture, uh, people 
think of themselves as acolytes of the divine mm-hmm. and, and and especially when they're judging people from past generations you know of course the reparations talk mm-hmm. and all that kind of stuff and, and say well they, these people are bad i'm good but really shouldn't we be identifying with Jesus, judas as a betrayer and, and peter as a denier and uh and uh mm-hmm. you know that kind of stuff i thought that was kind of an interesting yeah. Uh, talk and and um, and uh, mentioned there. Mm-hmm. Well, it's very very Welcome topical. To uh, sorry to cut you off, um, but we just celebrated Palm Sunday, of course, as Catholics. And one of the big readings on Palm Sunday is the Passion and Death of Jesus, and it's unique throughout the whole liturgical year in that the 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 congregation participates in the reading. You know, it's like a basically like sort of a, a play script, um, and and you're the we are the voice of the crowd, and the voice of the crowd is always the people. Who are either denying Jesus or like insulting him in some fashion, right? You have the the priest is is the voice of Jesus, and you have like a narrator reading, you know, a lot of the text, and then there's an additional voice. But the crowd are the ones who are shouting, you know, give us Barabbas, and the one shouting, you know, he he saved others, but he cannot save himself. You know, he's not really the Lord. Things like that, and I really like that because it's like you know, um, it, to put you in the perspective of you know, this was a crowd of people who maybe at one point in time did believe in Jesus. You know, just a week before. You know, he was he was sentenced to death. You know, he was welcomed, you know, by the crowds with with palms and everything. And so it's like, you know, we, we might think ourselves Christians, um, but we need to to align ourselves more with 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 Judas and with Peter denying Jesus more often than not. I don't know. You said we, you, I think you used the wrong word. We don't want to align ourselves with them. We no, no, sorry. Identify, identify with them. Our, our weak characters and, and our deficits rather than. I, I, I follow the Judas I mean, Iscariot school of thought. <laughs> that, 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 that's 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 my philosophy going forward. <laughs> Um, you know, I'm surprised he's not a cult hero. You know, they they yeah. like Sh- Che Guevara, but you never hear anybody really um you saying, you know, um Judas Iscariot was right, you know. Mm. You know, maybe you unusual. do. I, I've yeah. never gone to a to, to a satanic church, but I would imagine that a lot of the people who are like, you know, I'm a Satanist would really like Judas. I don't know that that's true. Mm. I think he's just universally despised because he's a turncoat. And he did it for a pittance of money, or maybe it was a lot of money. I don't know what the going rate was for betraying your your leader. Mm-hmm. I don't think the, it was a lot of money um, because the story ends. It's kind of a footnote, like in the gospel. Um, yeah. But but Jesus or Judas kills himself, of course. Yeah. Um, and he and he gives the money. He tries to give it back to the to the high priests or whatever. He's like, I don't want this. Um, but because you know it was blood money, they can't deposit it in like the 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 temple treasury, and so they use it to buy a plot of land for burying foreigners. So presumably mm-hmm. this is a pretty crummy plot of land on like the outskirts of town somewhere. So I'm guessing it was a pretty, you know, insignificant sum of money, but I, yeah. but I could be wrong there. I'm not entirely sure how, how the, the 30 silver coins, I think it was really translates into, in today's, in today's money. Uh, pieces of silver, wouldn't it? Pieces you know of said? silver, maybe. Yeah. So I said silver coins, but I'm not sure. Oh, same difference. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. Anyway, so I'm not, I'm not encouraging our listener to go out and, and join a Judas Iscariot cult. <laughs> you'd think that he would be mentioned in our profession of faith as the person that caused all this instead of that poor government official punches pilot. Mm. Uh, that still bothers me. I don't know why. <laughs> uh, well, maybe because I know so many public officials that are just trying to do the, oh, I'm trying to figure out a way out of this crisis. Uh, mm. Take Barabbas. You... Anyway, um, uh, so scriptural influences on a middle earth. We talked about scripture, what's truth and, and, you know, how, how, you know, Tolkien thinks he can be inspired, uh, or thinks authors, I guess, can be inspired, especially the, um, you know, the, the great myths of our day. And so, so there's a discussion of what, what are the scriptural influences on middle earth? You know, the thing that he created, and and the author is claiming, I think you said this before, that that at some point he's trying to, well, I guess the earliest timeline would be if this is, and it's, I think it was supposed to be ultimately Earth history mythology. Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, but um, after Genesis and before Jesus, somewhere in that mm-hmm. range, you know, the, the, these ages. Um, and then he, he talks about Ellen Deal as a Noah figure. Mm-hmm. Remind me, who is Elendil and how is he a Noah figure? Do you get that reference? So, yes. So Elendil, um, correct your pronunciation there, Elendil, of course, is is the father of Isildur. He, and Wait Isildur's... a second. It's spelled E-L-E-N-D-I-L. Elendil. Yeah, Elendil. Elendil. You're, you're saying Elendil. Elendil. That's yeah. even better. Elendil. Emphasis, emphasis on the second E, not on the first. Elendil. 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 It's close enough. Um, but he's the father of Isildur, who's the guy who eventually cuts off Sauron's finger. You see that in like the, the prologue to to, oh, yeah, to the yeah. fellowship. 
But Elendil was a guy, so, so in Numenor, the island of all the great men, there was a period of time, you know, towards the end of its history, they turned to Sauron, they forsake, they forsook the elves, you know, we don't like the gods anymore, all that sort of stuff, except for very few of them, Elendil was one of those. And so uh, the story of Numenor ends, you know, spoilers, I guess, um, uh, and for the Rings of Power, that that horrible uh, Amazon TV show that's that's going on is roughly adapting the story. But it ends with them, uh, with, with the host that's evil now, they're going to go sail over to heaven, essentially, which is still a physical place. And they're going to go challenge the gods. And they say, you know, you were wrong, blah, 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 blah. Elendil and a few other people are like, this guy is crazy. We need to save as much as possible. And so they like secretly get on their own ships and they sail east to Middle Earth. And that's how really the Numenorians come to, to, to permanently settle on Middle Earth. And then in the process of all this, Numenor is entirely sunk. Heaven is removed as a physical place. The world becomes round. Uh, it was previously flat and you could get to heaven physically. Now it's round. So you cannot physically cross the ocean and get to heaven. Like it's still a straight line, but now the, the earth curves down below the straight line. And the elves can still get there by crossing that straight line, which is it, it's it's an interesting little piece there. But but essentially in the flooding of Numenor and in the sinking and in the, the, the world is fundamentally changed, you know, a whole continent sinks and everything. Then Elendil saves, you know, uh, what is essentially the, the, the few chosen people out of the Numenorians. So that's how he's a Noah figure. Okay, the, the, thank you for that explanation. And, there, the, and the author says there's some references to that those Numenorians had some connection to ancient Egypt. Is there actually references to that in the in the book? And he mentions the book, the book of lost tales, mm -hmm. and a Gondolin. Who's Gondolin? Gondolin is a city. It was one of the oh. the great cities in the Silmarillion. Okay, so oh, I see. He puts Gondolin beside the great cities of the world, including Rome, Rome, Babylon, and Nineveh and Troy. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, so he's trying to fit this thing in into a timeline within, mm -hmm. you know, within Bible. He was uh, at one point in time. The Book of Lost Tales is one of those History of Middle Earth books, so a collection of unpublished stuff. So in oh. his earlier drafts, he was like, I, I want to tie this in, you know, specifically to, to Genesis history and things like that. So it could have been that he could have considered all that a mistake. That's why he didn't publish it. I mean, he, he went back and forth in that a lot throughout his life. And that's like a big theme throughout his letters is whether or not it's really like a Christian work, whether it's really like a pagan work and things like that. Um, I, I don't think he would have considered it a mistake. I, I do still think, you know, throughout his entire work, you know, there's definitely that underlying element of, OK, this is this is an ancient history and this will eventually become our own like that. That element is still present. I just think he removed any explicit references to, you know, real world places. Yeah. So um, then we get on to a discussion of the Semerillion, which is described as quasi-biblical by mm -hmm. Tolkien, I guess, and that Tolkien thinks that's his best work. Is that true, that he thought the Semerillion was the best? I believe that is Austin Freeman's uh, input there. Um, ah, but beautiful. it could have been shared by Tolkien. The, the Silmarillion is definitely, you know, somewhat biblical in, in nature. I could pull out my copy from off the shelf there, but each each book I is... or each. <laughs> It, well, it starts off with this creation story similar to Genesis, very poetic and things like that. And then it goes into to more like history and lineages and things like that. And each each chapter is roughly its own separate story that links into one bigger picture. So you have mm -hmm. one story about, you know, how the dwarves came to be. You have one story about, you know, how Gondolin was founded. You have one story about, you know, um, the, the eventual end of the universe, essentially, or the, the end of this world and things like that. And so each each chapter is roughly segmented like you would expect in a religious work. Very well. So, um, so then there's a there's a there's a mention that this is actually after Genesis, but before Abraham. Mm -hmm. uh, do you agree with that timeline description that the author gives? That that's where Tolkien is thinking this is going to be. And do you mm -hmm. do, do you think that there's some sort of scriptural influences with regard to that history of Middle Earth? Do you think there's do you do you, do you agree with that that there's some sort of influence or a, a specific intent on Tolkien to have it similar or mm -hmm. somehow influenced by scripture. I mean, I would say if you do have to place it anywhere in real world history, that is where you'd have to place it after Genesis before, you know, uh, Abraham, you know, you can't really have a book if it's written after Abraham with the, with the Christian that, you know, Tolkien is and not have like any mention of the tribes of Israel and things like yeah. that. You know, if it is like this sort of historical work that he's working with. So you have to place it um, in, in a sort of, mystical unknown age and that's what you really do have because genesis right if you do trace like the lineage of, of of adam and like the the exact dates of of the deaths of all of his sons and things like that you can work out i think like the the estimate is around 4000 bc 
is if you follow like that exact lineage to the T is is really when when Genesis is, you know, around that time. Um, but it really it is vague. And he mentions that in here about, you know, whether Genesis is more poetic rather than than literal and stuff. Um, so I think, you know, it is sort of in that murky sort of area where it's like, you know, this is the past. This is the the beginning. And then from there, then we get more and more historical as the Bible goes on. So yeah. I think it is it is just in this murky area and not necessarily one specific point in the timeline. Understood. Good, good explanation. Thank you. I appreciate it. So then there's a discussion in the book about special individual revelations in Middle Earth. And that's like these supernatural revolution mm-hmm. revelations. And he goes, he actually has this, I think it's a subtopics of mm-hmm. uh, prophecy, visions and voices, dreams, divine guidance, inspired speech, and tongues. Mm-hmm. So let's take them one by one. All right, let's do bam, it. Bam, bam. Uh, prophecy, foretelling. Now, there, obviously, there's a number of references to foretelling, some of which I knew um, and some of which I've, I don't think I've heard about. But um, do you think that his prophecy type um, writings, you know, those those kind of plot lines of his various writings, do you think that those are um, Christian influences or trying to be similar to a Christian text? Or what, what are your views about that as it plays into with this discussion about mm-hmm. Tolkien's beliefs? Do you think it really says something, you know, this prophecy type thing about whether you believed in prophecies, you know, the Christian prophecies, or is it just a, it's a really good um, writing tool and tactic, you know, like for composing a, a great long story. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I, I think it's a mix of both for sure. Um, I don't think it's necessarily like, okay, we have these prophets in the Bible. We have to have prophets in, in my, you know, fantasy world. I think it's more of you know, you, Tolkien wanted to make sure his his works, you know, the, the, the more I think about it, I think the more he wanted to make sure that his writings aligned with Christian teaching. And so, mm-hmm. you know, it is possible for us to, to have the, the gift of prophecy, especially in the Old Testament with, you know, our whole, you know, section of the Bible that is just the books of the prophets. Um, so I, I don't necessarily think it is because it is biblical, it is in Middle Earth, but because it is biblical, it is able to be in Middle Earth. And I think a lot of his his prophecies aren't, you know, the scale of the actual prophets of the Bible. They're, they're, they do center around major plot points, as as he points out, but it's not like, okay, here is how the story is going to end. Here's where the Savior is going to come in. It's okay, I, I have this vision of, you know, Gollum's going to play a large role. You know, that's that's, that's that's the big thing that, that Gandalf says is, you know, you know, he still has a part to play. I have, I have seen that much. Um, so I don't think it's necessarily these big revelations, but I do think, you know, prophecy is a big element there. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, and and uh, his his prophecies uh, is on page fifty one. The author mentions his prophecies are never frivolous, but hold fast to the old English concept of doom and fate. <laughs> uh, and and it's, it mentions even when Galadriel literally tells Gimli's fortune. Mm-hmm. What is that? Well, I don't remember that. What, yeah, I meant to I meant to look up that reference. Uh, I'm gonna look it up now if you want to keep talking here. Um, so, I mean, there's obviously there's moral. El- he mentions this specifically. There's moral elements of these these prophecies about fighting good and and trying to be inspired as you go forward. You have this feeling that you know what's going to happen, or maybe it, it comes in um, in a dream or whatever. We're going to get to that in a little bit. But these prophecies about you know that there's some sort of higher meaning or mission. Um, seems to be very similar to, you know, a, a Christian foreshadowing of Jesus. And then, of course, re- referencing that explicitly in the in the uh, in the Gospels. Mm-hmm. And um, have you figured out the reference? If you have not, we'll move on. I am finding it right now. Uh, essentially, she tells him, you know, in this whole scene where she's giving them them gifts and everything. Yeah. Um, in in Lothlorien and things like this that. Is, she, this is the way I said this is right. This is the story. They're on the quest mm-hmm. to destroy the ring in the in the uh, in the volcano, and mm-hmm. so they end up in the elf woodlands. Yes, and the Galadriel has like a mirror thing mm-hmm. or whatever. And this the, isn't with the mirror. Uh, Sam and oh. Frodo are the two who go to the mirror, but she just specifically talks to Gimli. Um, oh yeah, the, yeah. Her, her her message is 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 here about you know he has, he has a lot of fears you know as as a dwarf you know about the the role of money and, and gold and things like that. And she tells him that you know in the future you will have an abundance of wealth, 
but it will have no effect over your mind. You know, that that is the fortune that she gives them. You know, it's, it is very much a fortune cookie saying, you know, if you really kind of dumb it down, you know, you'll have a lot of wealth, but you will still be the same, you know, things like that. That, that is the fortune so would, that she gives to Gimli. So he would not have the uh, the sickness that uh, Thorin Oakenshield suffered from in his father. The, yes, the, the, exactly. The, the gold fever or whatever it was. <laughs> yes, the dragon fever. Right. The dra- That's right. Thank you, dragon fever. All right, what about uh, visions and voices? Mm-hmm. There's all sorts of visions and voices. So these visions and, and voices, I don't remember seeing a whole lot of, uh, I guess, I guess Faramir had a vision of Boromir mm-hmm. being dead, which I never really understood. I guess, I don't know if that was, it was a dream or something, you know, that dead upon the river, I think, right? Mm-hmm. That yes. Yeah. yeah. He sees him floating down the river, you know, in, in the way that they pushed him off the waterfall. Right. Um, the Files of Raros. So um, I, I didn't see there was too many of these. There's uh, not, and they're, and they're they're very vague when they do happen. Um, right. these sort of visions. Um, but I get, but it is interesting to point out, you know, this is something that happens. This is this divine mm-hmm. influence. Um, you know, this is really played up um in the Return of the King movie. Um, after uh Frodo fights Shelob, the big spider, um, mm-hmm. and he falls down to the ground because uh, he's weary or tired or whatever. Um, and he falls into the grass, and then he sees Galadriel here, and he remembers, you know, her voice and everything like that, you know, telling him to to not give up hope. And then he tries to to go on, and then he gets like stabbed by the spider immediately after that um, which i always think is, is kind of a funny thing to include in the movie i'm like yeah soldier on and the, and the spider shows up and immediately sticks him in the gut exactly. um yes. yeah but but sort of you know those, those sorts of visions it's not like okay here's where you need to go next it's it's you know I, I faintly heard this voice you know something was calling me in this direction that was my my biggest disappointment in the movie adaptation of the book was after Shelob uh, stabs him, there's, there's more, I think there's a long, maybe a full chapter, it seemed to me, it's been a while, of Sam mm-hmm. going through like the tunnels and chasing after these guys and this and that and putting the ring on. Um, and, and I don't, they seem to just cut, cut that thing very short. And all of a sudden there's like a battle between the two uh, tribes of orcs and they kill all each other. And then there's like two guys left and then Sam mm-hmm. comes in today. So I, I, yeah. I well, well technically, liked... if, if we're critiquing the movie, that all those scenes were in the wrong movie. Um, all the stuff with Shelob and the Tower uh, of Cure Thungal, which is where uh, Frodo is, is imprisoned, are at the end of the Two Towers. Uh, that that's where that all that stuff happens, and then the oh. Two Towers ends. I think it ends, if I remember correctly, with Sam saving Frodo, and then they move on into Mordor, and that's the cliffhanger oh. for Book Three is what they're going to do once they get into Mordor. Right. Um, so you're right. Yeah, you know, Sam does have a much bigger role there in the right. books than he does in the movies, um, which yeah. is kind of a shame because a lot of that stuff is really good and it's a lot yeah. of great moments for Sam. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think uh, I think uh, what's his name, Jackson, Peter Jackson. Yeah, uh, Peter Jackson. He played up the Frodo angle a little bit too much. <laughs> it really should have been a story about how uh, Sam was a hero. You just don't was. like the actor. Well, I don't know him, but he's a bad uh, actor. Uh, uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Anyway, moving on to the next section, dreams. Um, and there's a reference to the poem Pearl. Do you know anything about that? I don't know yes, anything. that is oh. in, uh, I, I think I've mentioned this before, actually. This is in uh, uh, in his translation of Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. There's two other works included. One is Pearl and one is Sir Orfeo. And Pearl is a story uh, about, it, it's a really sad poem, uh, actually. Um, it's about a man who's like lost his daughter. Um, and it's essentially him, you know, grieving over his dead daughter um and so it's set within a dream and he he sees her it's been a long time since i've read it but he sees her you know in in the form of a pearl essentially oh interesting so it it mentions that tolkien in his introduction to the poem pearl uh writes the middle ages were a time when people still considered that dreams could at times give glimpses of truth and you see that throughout Tolkien's writing, I think. And the, the, what I remember is that, you know, they'd, oh, I had a dream of blah, 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 blah. And, and, it, and it vaguely comes true. There's not a whole lot of detail. Um, and uh, and he seems to have an idea personally that that you can get some sort of message or um, have divine inspiration out of, uh, from dreams. I think it's a pretty common thought. Mm-hmm. And, um, I, 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 I certainly think that, pe- that I can work through things Mm-hmm. with my dreams you know like the next day you know, i always have a habit of saying well i'm gonna sleep on it and it seems like um a big decisions it's better to to sleep on it and i don't know if i remember the dreams but i always seem to have a better idea what yeah. i should do the next day what are your yeah, thoughts what... about tolkien's theories of 
dreams and divine inspiration. Well, we get into one of Tolkien's dreams, I think a little bit later, uh, with his his flood dream, his Atlantis dream, which is really big yes. in, in his life, but um, I'll leave that for later. Uh, one of the more interesting parts is kind of like the refusal of the dream, um, which we have with Faramir and Boromir. I don't know if you remember this in the books, uh, but when they, uh, but uh, Faramir has a dream that he should go to the Council of Elrond and he needs to represent Gondor like 50 times or something. And every time he goes to his dad, you know, the, the best father of all time, Denethor, um, he's like, I need to go to the Council of Elrond. I need to be there. I need to represent Gondor. And every time uh, Denethor says no. And then Boromir has the same dream one singular time. And Denethor says, OK, yeah, you need to go to the Council. Um, so it's 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 a funny I mean, not really funny because Boromir ends up dead. Um, but it's it's kind of an idea of, you know, well, if Faramir had been allowed to follow his dream, you know, would things have turned out differently? You know, Boromir pro or, you know, Faramir probably wouldn't have tried to take the ring from Frodo. He probably wouldn't have ended up dead. They might have been able to go to Gondor uh, more easily, things like that. So it's an idea of, you know, what happens if you do refuse the messages that are in your dreams? You know, does it make things potentially worse? Yeah. Interesting. And, you know, that, that uh, I've been thinking about while we're talking about this. Um, why don't we have any prophets now? I mean, what's left to, to prophesy? I don't know, the end of the world? Yeah, I think John already did that. I don't know. So, I, mean, I, think, I think we have a whole book called Revelation. Yeah, and I'm trying to plow through that now. It's a wild book. but it is um, wild. So what, but, I mean, it's been 2,000 years. Mm -hmm. Is it God just done? <laughs> I, I don't think that's how it works. <laughs> well, no, I mean, you know, there are prophets in the Old Testament. Of course, a lot of that referencing, you know, the coming of, you know, Jesus. Mm-hmm. But not all of it directly related to that, I don't think. There's like a bunch of repent sinner type prophets. Sure. And um, and then, you know, now there hasn't any? I, I mean, I mean, I, I think it's, I, it's I, also I like... I remember I asked my son when I, uh, my son, my dad, when I was young, hey, dad, you know, the Bible talks about all these demonic possessions. Seems like every every town Jesus goes into, he's pulling these souls out of people, <laughs> these de demons possessing people. You know, why isn't why isn't that happening now? Why why don't we have demonic possession now? And the, he had an explanation about well, Jesus came and blah blah blah, but he also kind of alluded to well, we're more highly educated and yeah yeah yeah. I didn't think that was sufficient either. But I kind of suspect that there is, you know, I don't know, maybe it, it sounds goofy to say it uh, rather than just kind of have an impression of it. But there's a lot of crazy people out there that is not explained by mental illness. You know, it's like I have a friend. I have a friend here who who believes exactly that, um, especially in terms of a lot of like the, the, the split personality disorder and a lot of like the gender dysphoria type stuff. Um, you know, there's there's a person that he's talked to. Um, who's said some like creepy creepy things um which you know i don't mean to if they if they do truly have a mental illness i don't want to make fun of them in that regard right, but it's right. it's you know this because she was talking like you know well the last time you know um my host was in my body we, we were in a we were in a different form and it takes mm -hmm. a while to get used to the new height you know i have height dysphoria now and and, and my friend is like well I, I think that's definitely demonic possession if you were talking like there's a plurality of beings inside of you um, and they have experiences of another body, um, then, then, you know, that is, that is a sign of demonic possession. I'm like, so, so wouldn't it make sense that God would have some of us out there, like pulling these s s demons out of people, you know, to, to further inspire them of the coming end of days, or we just, mm. could, you know, I don't know. That, I mean, I, I, it, it might, topic, but, uh, I mean, I think it's, it's also a thing of, you know, a, a lot of people have turned away from God too. And I think you have to be, you know, very close to, to God and be a very holy person in order to experience those things. And, you know, I think we did have a, a lot of stories of that, you know, up until, you know, relatively recently in history. I've been doing a lot of reading about Joan of Arc. Um, that's an oh, interesting God. figure there. Yeah. I don't know, you don't like Joan of Arc? I don't know. I don't like, no, I don't know. Okay. I mean, I mean, we have a lot of saints in the Catholic church, I think for exactly that reason is that we recognize that God does still work through people in a similar fashion. Hmm. Yeah. Maybe I'll be a prophet. <laughs> Can, well, can list I that on your resume? Can I choose that? I don't know. Potential profit. That's how you'll you'll apply for for positions. There is a potential. I think it would have, you'd have to be actual or not. Mm, probably potentially, you're just a nut. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta believe, man. You gotta be. It's either to be or not to be. That is the question. All right. Divine guidance. Have we talked about that? We just not did. Yet. 
No, oh, I thought we just did. I mean, there's not too much to mention. It's yeah, just it, vague, it, vaguer, you know, central. Yeah, even, even more generalities about uh, the will of Eru and, mm-hmm. and uh, because because there really isn't a whole lot. Of, there wasn't really any talk of God. I don't mm-hmm. think within Lord of the Rings and Hobbit. Not too much. Seem no, to be any sort of divine talking. So we're going to skip over that. Other than yeah, there's something in there. So then, but then there is inspired speech and tongues, which of course, as a linguist. Um, you know, there, there, there's, you know, talk about like the strength of, well, like uh, he who not, cannot be named, which is similar to uh, Harry Potter talking about Sauron, you know, mm-hmm. it's like some sort of power. And then, then the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the bad evil tongue, what, what is that called? Uh, black speech. The black speech. Yeah. As if there's some sort of power, if you just say the words in that vocabulary, there's a lot of that in there about um, inspired speech and mm-hmm. different you know, speaking in tongues, being able to speak a language you didn't learn uh, within. So do you think there's some sort of, you know, scripture type reference or allusion or, uh, you know, to, to that in Tolkien's writings, or do you think there's any meaning to that? I mean, I think definitely, I think he points out a good example. I don't know if you, you mentioned this, um, but um, he points out Frodo on Weathertop when he's facing the, the nine Nazgul and they're trying to stab him, they're trying to get him. You know, he, there's there's this passage in there. He's like, he doesn't know why he says this. He doesn't know where it comes from, but he shouts out Albareth Gothoniel, um, which is essentially, um, well, I don't know how best to describe it. It's it, it's essentially like a like a hail mary in a way. Albareth is is sort of a divine figure, um, some somehow related to the stars. I'm forgetting a lot of my my Tolkien, uh, you know, lore there. But you know, he he doesn't know why he says it. He's never heard those words in his life, but he, but he says those words as a sort of Hail Mary, and he thinks that's a lot of the reason why he's protected from the Nazgul in that instance. Mm. But he's still stabbed with a dark sword. He is still stabbed, but he doesn't die. It's mm. a good point. All right. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so the ne- next topic, after talking about those, you know, um, tongues and divine guidance, and that kind of stuff, is what was, did Tolkien think that he was inspired by God? Mm-hmm. I mean, that, that's really the next section, which is pretty lengthy. Mm-hmm. And um, do you want to give any preliminary thoughts? Because I think this is really probably, I think, the most interesting topic mm-hmm. of the book, although I've not read the whole book. But mm-hmm. do, you, do, do you think Tolkien thought he was inspired by God? And secondly, do you think he was inspired by God? I think Tolkien was too humble to ever believe that he was actually inspired by God. I think he thinks it's a possibility that people can be, and he thinks, you know, certain parts— you know, of the story did not come from himself. And I think that there's there's sort of a, of a of an inkling of an idea that, yes, there was some sort of divine influence on him writing these things, but I don't think he ever really explicitly says it. He does allude to it in, in certain parts, and uh, Austin Freeman gets into that. Um, but but I do think so. I think, you know, with a lot of these great authors, like I was mentioning earlier, you know, there there is some sort of divine influence there. If you write a truly great work that points to some higher truth, um, then I think that there there has to be some influence of God on you. And I think that's happened, you know, throughout all of history. I think a lot of the the greatest authors and the greatest creators have been influenced by God. Hmm. Uh, uh, my belief, uh, no, not knowing Mr. Tolkien, never mm-hmm. met him, I believe that he thought he was inspired by God. You think so? But I, think, I think he was too humble to ever say it. Mm-hmm. You know? And I think if you say it, you're, you're, you're immediately discounted. And I, I think privately probably because if you look at the, at the examples of some of his writings about whether authors can be inspired by god you know like the just like the argument you just laid out i, I think especially when it when it, when the his writings seemed to resonate with people during his lifetime you know and, and once it was done you know that body of work i i think i think he would almost have to come to the conclusion so it's almost like it's more humble to say this really isn't a product of me this is something else. You know, if you if you do something truly great, you almost have to acknowledge that it's beyond, you mm-hmm. know, what you're individually capable of in a way. Mm-hmm. You know, it's more humble to say it's divinely inspired, oddly. Don't you think? I agree. Yeah. And I, I, but I don't I I I I think I think he probably had a sense that there was something else going on, some sort mm-hmm. of higher power either guiding him or helping him or whatever. Um and I and I and I think I think I, I think I think he he would be probably right about that if he thought that mm-hmm. because it really is a a beautiful story and, and it's a story about good and evil and and the forces um, that can sweep you up if and and that sometimes you just have to either sacrifice everything or you have to risk everything. Mm-hmm. 
for the right reasons, unselfishly to help the world or individuals or your friends and, and all that. Mm -hmm. No, I agree. I, I definitely agree. I mean, it's, it's definitely points. Like I was saying, I do think the Lord of the Rings points to a higher truth. The higher truth is not that, you know, hobbits are real and elves are real, but it is, you know, the themes that you were talking about, about good and evil and about what is just and about what you need to do um, in these horrible situations and, you know, the, the nature of evil itself um, and I think any work that that accurately describes those things and describes them in, in such a beautiful way does have to have some sort of influence from something else. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, um, but the author was, is careful to say that, you know, Tolkien never claimed that mm -hmm. it was divinely inspired. Uh, but, he, he, but he does mention on page 56 that he did seem to eventually believe that he received large portions of it from God by the, by the minister. Let's see, no, 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 no. Uh, he did not believe his work ought to be considered inspired in the same sense of the Bible or the church's teaching, but it did seem to eventually believe that he received a large portion of it by God somehow, like through mm -hmm. his talent um, you know, and then a, like a normal creative process. I think mm -hmm. you know, kind of paraphrasing the, the, the author uh, at least that's the author's conclusion. I think he, he's, I think the three of us seem to be in agreement. Mm -hmm. Yes, I would say so. Tolkien's belief, and I don't know if the author thinks it was divinely inspired, but uh, that Tolkien seemed to, to have a sense that it was, uh, there's something else going on there, that he didn't just create this out of whole cloth just from his own talent. Mm -hmm. And then they, he gives examples that, um, to, like, for example, I thought it was interesting. He didn't, he, that Tolkien admitted that he neither invented nor even desired the character of Faramir, mm -hmm. which I think is an interesting way to look at it. But, you know, if, and I used to be more creative when I was younger. Um, it's interesting. It, it's, it's true. If you're writing something that, that inspiration hits you and, and you kind of sometimes don't know what to do with it mm -hmm. and, you, and you put it down and then later something else will pop in. And, and it was, kind of, that was interesting to me. And there was another one that was a foreshadowing reference. I forget where it was at. Um, in one of his books and he went back and he's like, oh yeah, this oh, oh, the, the ends that he kind of anticipates mm -hmm. sort of tree character. And then later, you know, flushed it out uh, mm -hmm. with the ends characters. Well, so I'm surprised, you, I'm surprised he didn't mention here um, one, one important note, which is the, the opening sentence of the Hobbit and a hole in the ground there lived a Hobbit. He, he had no idea why he wrote that. He was grading papers because of course he was a professor and he just kind of absentmindedly, you know, flipped over a piece of paper and wrote on the back of it, you know, those few words and he's like, he had no idea of what this was. He had no idea what this was going to be, um, but he wrote down those words and he didn't know why. And I think that is exactly what he's talking about here. You know, he didn't know where the character of Faramir came from. He doesn't know where, you know, the, the Ents really came from. It came from something else. And I think we need to look back at the very beginning of where this all started, really, uh, of, you know, in a hole in the ground, there lived a hobbit. And I think that's just another example that we can add here of this coming from, from somewhere uh, other than himself. You, the, the author did mention that. Oh, did he? Oh, I must have skipped over it. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm trying to think. I, I I was just furiously looking for it because I had it underlined and circled somewhere. He did reference that that he was grading papers, and that uh, he, that he started the book and he had no reason why he started it. And then you know, and then such a, maybe it was at the beginning. I'm trying to remember, but he he had definitely definitely mentioned it mm -hmm. in this book. Uh, I, I apologize I, to Dr. Austin Freeman, who is undoubtedly yeah. still listening right now. I, I've I've glossed over a, a few sentences of your book. As you should, because it is in here, and I can't seem to find it. <laughs> uh, but uh, but yeah, he specifically referenced that as as part of his creative process that that it just kind of came in out of nowhere, um, which I just thought was really interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, here it is. What uh, page fifty five was Tolkien inspired? Uh, 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 while grading the students' oh. exams one day, Tolkien wrote down ten faithful words without any clear meaning behind them. Quote, in a hole in the ground, there lived a hobbit. Whence did the sudden impulse come? Tolkien seems to have explicitly admitted he believed his work to have been inspired in some sense. Mm -hmm. what, what sense it is, it could just be inspired creatively, I guess. But but it really is such a such a it's such a great start to a book. Mm -hmm. You know, how do, how do you come up with such a great first line? You know, because you, what is a hobbit? Mm -hmm. And uh, why is he living in a hole in the ground? Mm -hmm. You know, and, and and it just seems so welcoming. And it's kind mm -hmm. of a, a passive voice almost in a hole in the ground. There lived a hobbit. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not it's not a declaratory sentence. It's it's a description. And you, you immediately want, you immediately picture like Peter Rabbit or something, mm -hmm. you know, like, oh, 
Well, this is interesting. Well, well, he goes on the next the next sentences. You know, it's not a nasty, dirty, wet hill, hole filled with the ends yeah. of worms and an oozy smell. Nor yet was it a dry, bare, sandy hole with nothing in it to sit down on or nothing to eat. This was a hobbit hole, and that means comfort. And that's the opening paragraph to the Hobbit. Yeah. You know, it's it's very welcoming. It's very inviting, and it's it's intriguing. You know, I, I don't know what any of those things are. You know, what is a Hobbit? But and then right. you you find out. Mm -hmm. Great, great writing. That's that's why. Now that's that's from the Hobbit, correct? Yes, the the opening paragraph to the Hobbit. That is his true greatest work, the Hobbit. Oh, I highly disagree with that. <laughs> Um, so, um, I mean, the, 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 the book goes on and on about whether he feels inspired or not. I don't know if we want to go through the different mm -hmm. uh, arguments or references, but because we kind of came to the, the same conclusion and it seems like that this creative, uh, process that he had, that he, he believes that there, that these myths can be inspired, I think, uh, by God. And I think he certainly entertains the possibility that, uh, his story could be inspired by God mm -hmm. and, and uh, even in his writings and all that stuff. Would you want to add anything else to that topic? I want to mention that the reference to the Notion Club papers is is really interesting because this is this is a substantial section of the History of Middle Earth series. Uh, Tolkien wrote a lot um, uh, on the relatively speaking on this idea of, of the Notion Club. Um, and it's it's like several layers deep of like meta talking about himself. Um, because the Notion Club papers is written, uh, the, the narrator of this this thing, the, the introduction to this work says, I found these papers from this academic club in this professorship. You know, he, he, here's here's what they said. And then the rest is it goes into the story itself. And one of the figures, like like uh, Freeman mentions, is very much related to Tolkien. Um, and this character, Raymer, who is sort of the, the, the representation of Tolkien, is talking about how he is writing his own story. Um, about, you know, time travel or something like that. And, and these scenes are sort of coming to him. And then you have further within that, then you have the scenes of the actual story that is coming to Raymer, that is coming to the to the narrator who is Tolkien. You know, it's it's so many layers deep. And this is at the same time, I believe, as Tolkien was trying to write his own time travel story, as the, uh, and C.S. Lewis was trying to write a space travel story. Um, and so C.S. Lewis, I forget the name of the book, but he wrote a science fiction novel and it was published and went on. Um, and Tolkien's story... Um, was about uh, essentially, uh, I forget how many different drafts he went through, but one of the drafts at least, it was this father and, the, and this son who are sort of transported back in time into Numenor or what later became Numenor in his writings. And they sort of witnessed the end of Numenor. And um, this mm -hmm. ties into to, to Tolkien's wave dream, which I which I alluded to oh, earlier, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, which is this recurring dream that he had for, for years and years and years of, you know, he would fall asleep and he just imagined this gigantic wave, you know, crashing over him. And it was, it was very recurring. Um, and it only stopped, uh, what did he say, when, when he told his son about it, I, I believe, mm -hmm. um, and, then, and then his son acknowledged, I have had that same dream. And of course, that's incorporated into his writings in The Drowning of Numenor, in the fall of that that island beneath the sea. And he, he incorporates you know very vivid imagery there of that wave crashing over the people there. So the Notion Club Papers is this weird Tolkien writing about himself and about actual events through the guise of this other writer. And it's 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 fascinating. It's You could dive into it from like a million different angles. It was when he uh, bequeathed the dream of the hmm. great wave to Faramir in the yes. Lord of the Rings and incorporated into the Numenorean myth that the dream ceased. Mm -hmm. So once he wrote it down. Mm -hmm. As if Faramir had that dream. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. right. And then he, then, then he mentioned, that, most strangely, his son Michael revealed in 1955 that he had the same dream, though neither had ever spoken uh, of it before to the other. Mm -hmm. so, it was fascinating. Is, and they had a theory that it, it may have inherited from their 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 ancestors as an echo of their ethnic past. Hmm. Interesting. It is an interesting idea. Yes. Do you well, have anything I, else you want to summarize here? Uh, no, not really. It's a good chapter, interesting, and and um, I'm having a hard time focusing on uh, discussing. Tolkien's beliefs as opposed to my own, you mm -hmm. know, and, and how it's relevant to present day. The eternal uh, curse of, of Mark Bishop. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, what am I supposed to talk about? You know, the, I mean, the author mentions these things. So I, I, I'm trying to figure out a balance between integrating, you know, what his beliefs are and, and then, you know, if we're going to make any value judgments about it or agreements mm -hmm. with. It. So, uh, but it's easy. It's, it's easy to read in the sense that it's, it's well written. Mm -hmm. For the audience, I, I just, I'm either going to have to start reading the footnotes or just ignoring them. <laughs> <laughs> That's the spirit. Yes. I don't know. What are your thoughts? Conclusions? I mean, I, I love this, this chapter. Um, 
this might be one of my favorite chapters out of any book we've we've ever read uh, for the podcast. Yeah. I, I just really like this idea of uh, of revelation in Tolkien and sort of, you know, exploring that idea of, you know, whether or not just an ordinary person who's writing something that's really not 100 percent related to, to Christianity at all, um, you know, except in its themes and its morals and stuff like that, you know, can that be divinely inspired? And of course, you know, I've, I've mentioned, I, I do think so. Um, and I do think, you know, we need more people like that, you know, in, in, the, in the current times and everything. Um, it's just a fascinating idea that along with the the idea of, of sub creation, which I think we talked about a little bit last time, but, you know, creating your own world and sort of, you know, living vicariously through that and, and stuff like that combined with this idea of divine revelation is, is, is very, very interesting to me. Yeah. Good deal. Mm -hmm. What do you think? what do you think of this chapter? I already said, didn't I? I guess you did. My my apologies. <laughs> you must have been ignoring me. Yeah, I must have just completely tuned you out. Yeah, you did. Because I gave my thoughts first and then I asked yeah, you. That is true. That is true. I, I am very sorry. Do you have any other closing thoughts before we wind things down? No. All right. Well, you can, of course, follow us on Twitter at ULMTD Opinions. Uh, let us, uh, that'll let you know when our next episodes are live. Um, hey, when, but, are our, when, when are our, our t-shirts coming in? We ordered those, the winning t-shirts. When are mm -hmm. they supposed to come in? I haven't gotten any notifications. Um, I think I got Your a notification account. that uh, they they were made and they were processed. Uh, I'm not sure exactly the date, but those are coming into our season. Our combined t-shirt for season three and four uh, is is in process of, of getting to us and then to you. Um, I think this, the, for this one, we need to uh, post pictures of the shirt. Mm, we do. We do. To, to uh, encourage people to participate in our next uh, contest, whatever that's going to be. Yes, I agree. All and right. We could, we could uh, have a special like uh, uh, necklace of Eowyn. Isn't that her name? They had the beautiful thing, but Jigger. Mm, yeah. The, the, oh, and what's it called? In, it crashed in the dream. Oh, no, no. You're thinking of Arwen. Um, Arwen. Not, not Eowyn. Oh, I'm forgetting the name of the necklace, but yeah, you're right. Mm. yes all right well any, any other closing thoughts no all right well this has been season five episode three of unlimited opinions i'm ben adam bishop still mark bishop Thank you all for for tuning in. All of us. Yes. All three of us. Me, you, and the uh, the uh, listener. And the listener. <laughs>